Okay, this is a lecture for my eighth hour United States history class. And I remind you tomorrow you'll have a quiz over what we talked about on Monday. So look over that night. Anyway, when we left off, we were talking about the election of 1912. And in 1912, the Republican Party split between William Howard Taft, who was nominated by the Republican Party to be president, and Theodore Roosevelt, who was a progressive liberal Republican, and when he didn't get the Republican nomination, he split away and formed his own party. And it's never good when a political party divides, okay? Going into election, you want to be as united as you possibly can. And Roosevelt and his followers split from the main Republican Party, and they formed a party, a progressive party, a liberal party called the Bull Moose Party. Uh, and then, of course, you had the Democrats. They nominated Woodrow Wilson. In fact, here's a great cartoon from the time. The symbol of the Republican Party then and now was, you know, you remember the guy we talked about, Thomas Nast? Remember the Thomas Nast, the cartoonist? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, well, he, he's the guy who first drew these symbols of the party, and it stuck. Today, if you watch the, listen, in 2024, they're going to have a Republican convention, and if you watch that convention, there'll be people out there with elephant hats on with a long trunk because the elephant is the symbol of the Republican Party. The donkey is the symbol of the Democrat Party. So there's Taft, the Republican, riding on an elephant. There's Wilson, dressed like a college professor in a tweed coat and a touring hat. And uh, there he is on a donkey. And, of course, there's Teddy Roosevelt with the big stick behind. He's got his old campaign hat on, his Western cowboy hat on. And, of course, his bull moose is biting the uh, Republicans in the rear. In other words, Teddy Roosevelt is a pain in the, uh, so far as the Republicans are concerned. And they're all going up that hill to the White House, okay? They're all going up the hill to the White House. Well, so, uh, you know, the campaign turns into a pretty dirty campaign, not by today's standards. By today's standards, it was really mild. But it turns into a pretty dirty campaign, you know, the race is really between T.R. and Wilson. They're the two celebrities in this. Poor Taft, he's ignored. Uh, and uh, Roosevelt, uh, toward the end of the campaign, it was scheduled to make a speech in Wisconsin. And we talked about this yesterday. He gets out of his car and he's going in the auditorium. And this insane bartender named John Shrank, who said that William McKinley's ghost had told him to kill Roosevelt, steps out and presses a little path that they're walking, you know, because the people are mobbing him and the police and this guy managed to wiggle through the police line and just stands there with a gun, just like this pointing. And he fires it and it goes through. We talk about, it went through Roosevelt's coat. He had a 50 page speech. We talk about what deflected it up. Spare yeah. pair of glasses. And he falls down and they dog pile shrank, haul him off to the police station. Uh, and Roosevelt gets up and they say, Colonel, we've got to take you to the hospital. And he said, no, I'm scheduled to make this speech and I'm going to make it. So he takes his handkerchief out and he stuffs it in the bullet hole. And then he goes in and sits on the stage. Well, the people inside didn't know what had happened. They didn't have no idea what had happened. And there's Roosevelt just sitting up there looking like Roosevelt. And that day, two people introduced him and they made long introductions. And there he is sitting there bleeding with a bullet in him listening to this. So he gets up to speak and he says to them, <clears throat> uh, you know, sort of, by the way, on the way in here, a guy shot me. And they all thought he was, and they all oh, oh, laughed, you know, laughed. And Roosevelt said, no, really? And he takes his, unbuttons his coat and he takes his coat and it's just covered with blood. And, oh, you know, they can't believe it. And he goes on and continues to talk, but he's losing blood steadily. So he starts talking about things when he was a little boy, you know, he goes back to his childhood because of this blood loss. And finally, so one of his aides comes out and says, come on, Colonel. And they take him to the hospital and they dig the bullet out. And in three days, he was back on the campaign trail. Okay. And Roosevelt is a young man. Uh, but uh, none of that made any difference because get this down. Woodrow Wilson became the president of the United States. Woodrow Wilson became president of the United States. And you don't have to write these numbers down, but in the end, Wilson got six. Well, uh, I'll just put the, you don't have to write these down, but in the end, uh, Wilson got 435 electoral votes, and that's what counts. Woodrow Wilson. Let's see. 
but he got uh, six million votes, okay, and 435 electoral votes. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt got uh, four million votes. TR got four million votes, and he got 88 electoral votes. And poor Taft finished third. Uh, Taft got three million votes, and I think he got eight electoral votes, okay? Uh, but my point is this. Look at this. Most people in that election voted for someone else other than Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Seven million to six million. A lot of historians believe that if T.R. had been the candidate, he would have beaten Wilson. But most people voted against Wilson in that election, but Wilson won the Electoral College, and he became <coughs> and he became president, okay? Seven million. To, and so Wilson was a minority. Uh, Wilson was a minority president. Uh, when Donald Trump was elected in, in, in uh, 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton got more votes. Most people in that election voted for someone other than Donald Trump. And there were people saying, oh, he's going to be a minority president. Can he be effective? Well, I've got a newsflash for those people. Uh, Teddy, uh, not t Abraham Lincoln, when Abraham Lincoln ran for president in 18... I'm sorry? Sure he was. There were four candidates in that race. 60% of the American people voted for someone other than Lincoln. Lincoln only got 39% of the vote, and he became president because those other three candidates divided the votes between them. And I would say that Lincoln did a pretty fair job. So just <coughs> because someone is a minority president, and I'm not comparing Lincoln and Trump, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, uh, there have been minority presidents that we build monuments to, like Abraham Lincoln. So that's not a sign that you're not going to be a good president. Well, Teddy Roosevelt then had split uh, the Republican Party. He had caused them to lose. But guess what? He's back in 1916. Uh, the next election is 1916. He's back in 1916. And he, he wants the Republican nomination. And the Republicans told him, get the heck out of here. You killed us in 1912. We're not going to nominate you. And some believe that he was gearing up for another run at the presidency in 1920. But he died in 1919. He died to sleep. He was sitting up in his room reading a book in the bed, and uh, his butler came in. His butler's name was James. His butler came in, and he said, uh, Colonel, is there, are there, is there anything uh, that you would like? And Roosevelt closed his book and put it on the nightstand and said, <clears throat> no. Uh, please turn out the, James, turn out the light. And James turned out the light and left. And the next morning when they came in the presidential bedroom, Roosevelt was dead. Uh, when they told the vice president, the then vice president, you know, Woodrow Wilson was president when TR died. And uh, the uh, vice president was a guy named uh, uh, William Marshall, I think. Anyway, his name was Marshall. And he was just coming out of the Senate. Uh, he had been over presiding over the Senate. He was coming out, and one of his aides rushed up and said, we just received word that Teddy Roosevelt died. And Marshall said, how did he die? And they said, well, he died in his sleep. And Marshall said, well, this is the statement he released to the press. He said, well, it's a good thing that death came for Roosevelt at night. If Roosevelt had been awake, there would have been a fight, end quote. And so Roosevelt was buried on a cold, rainy a uh, windswept day at Sagamore Hill, his home. Uh, and people were out there in umbrellas, you know, in the hill. He was buried on a hill, and it was slick and slippery. Uh, but at the end of the service, as people went down the hill to get in their cars and their buggies and to go away, uh, everybody noticed that standing up there with the grave diggers, waiting for everyone to leave, was this big hulk of a figure. And he was weeping so hard that his shoulders were shaking, heaving. Who was that? Taft. That was his best friend, Taft. Yeah. Yeah. They only spoke one time after this campaign, and it was by accident. Roosevelt was staying in a hotel, and he was in the dining room alone eating, and Taft was staying in the same hotel, but neither one of them knew it, and Taft was coming down the stairs to go out the front door and get in the car and go to some function, and he just happened to glance in the dining room, and there was sitting his, it was his old best friend, Teddy Roosevelt, and they sat down and they talked. And people, you know, said, oh, you know, there's two presidents talking. People kind of, no one went in, but they kind of looked. And uh, they, you know, thought, and people, witnesses said that they saw them smile a little bit. That seemed to be, you know, a congenial conversation. But uh, neither man wrote about it. 
Nobody said I met with, you know, Roosevelt never said, well, I was having dinner and Taft came in and we talked for about 15 minutes about this, this, and Taft didn't do it. So we don't know what they said, but that was the only time they spoke from 1912 onward. So T.R. died. Taft, by the way, went on to become a Supreme Court justice uh, and he became the chief justice of the Supreme Court. That's where he had always wanted to be. Uh, and so he, from 1921 to 1931, he's the chief justice of the Supreme Court. And I think he did a pretty good job. So now on with uh, Woodrow Wilson's administration. Okay, he served right. two terms correct. Huh? Woodrow Wilson served two terms correct. He did. Well, uh, write this down. He served from uh, 1913. He's elected in 1912. He served from 1913 until 1921. 1913. 1921, okay, Woodrow Wilson. And here's the main thing I want you to remember. I'm going to tell you a lot of things about Woodrow Wilson, but here's the main thing that I want you to remember about Woodrow Wilson. He was president of the, get this down, he was president of the United States during World War I. Here, he's president from 1913 to 1921. World War I breaks out in 1914. You can get that down too. World War I because we're heading right to World War I. World War I lasts from 1914 to 1918. Just about 104 years ago, we're not talking ancient history here, there are people alive right now who were alive when World War I was fought. They're older people, but they are uh, they don't remember World War I. They were just infants. They would have had to have been, but there are people who were alive when World War I was fought. Uh, the United States does not get involved until 1917, okay? We're not in the war very long. In fact, we declare war in 1917, but we don't actually get what they call today boots on the ground until 1918. So we're just in World War I for about the last six months of the war. Uh, if I were giving this lecture in London or in Paris or in Germany, the students would know a lot more about World War I than most American students do because they consider that their war. That's their war. Which war do we consider our war? World War II. World War II. That's our war. We're just there for six months. I mean, look at the numbers. How many British boys died in World War I in the trenches? A million. How many American boys died? 53,000. So we're not there, but, but our presence is very important, as you're going to see. In, in many ways, it determines the outcome of the war. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's all in the future. I want to talk to you a little bit about Woodrow Wilson. First thing, write this down. Uh, he's a Democrat. Woodrow Wilson is a member of the Democrat Party. The next thing, <clears throat> uh, he was a progressive. He's a progressive liberal Democrat. Same as T.R., except T.R. is a progressive Republican. And to get this down about him, he was the first Southerner elected since the Civil War. There had not been a Southerner. He was born in Virginia and raised in Georgia. There had not been a Southerner in the White House since the Civil War. People didn't trust them. People viewed them as traitors. And by the way, to Woodrow Wilson, the Civil War was no academic exercise. In my second hour class, we're going through the Civil War right now. But it was no... Uh, academic exercise to him. He didn't have to read a book. He didn't have to take a class. Uh, his father, like I say, Wilson was born in Virginia. His father was a Presbyterian minister, and his father took a church in Atlanta just as the Civil War was starting, and Wilson was a little boy, and he went to Atlanta. And You know, we've talked about the siege of Atlanta and General Sherman capturing Atlanta and then the, the burning of Atlanta. Remember that? Do you? Yeah, and how Sherman marched to the sea and destroyed the sea. Yeah, well, he lived through that. When Woodrow Wilson was a little boy, he's six or seven years old, but when Woodrow Wilson's a little boy, he used to go down with other little boys from Atlanta in his father's church basement, and their mothers would be rolling bandages for wounded Confederate soldiers, and he helped them do that. So he had what we call empirical evidence I don't have any empirical evidence concerning the Civil War because I wasn't, I didn't see it. Everything I know about the Civil War, I've read in books. But if you had been there, you would have empirical, empirical evidence is evidence you experience, okay? And Wilson had empirical evidence so far as the Civil War was concerned. 
I want you to write this down about him as well. He was uh, dev devoutly religious. He was a very, very religious man. He tended to see God's hand in everything. When he ran for, let me give you a quick illustration. When Wilson ran for president in 1912, he refused. You know, his, his aide said, you ought to go up to the Democrat National Convention and you ought to campaign a little bit. This is a close race. Someone else might get it. Wilson refused to go. He said, if God wants me to be president, I'll be president. Well, guess what? He managed to get the Democrat nomination and then he managed to elect, get elected president. He believed that God had got this down and because it explains a lot about Woodrow Wilson. He believed that God had chosen him to be the president of the United States. And if you believe that God has chosen you to be anyone or anything, uh, you might turn out like Woodrow Wilson to be stubborn and self-righteous. Get that down. He would not compromise. It's been said that politics is the art of compromise. Well, Wilson was an outsider. He said, I haven't been a professional politician all my life. He tended to look down on politicians. He said, they're dirty, they're dishonest, they're a bunch of sleaze bags. And I'm going to go to, well, Woodrow Wilson's a teacher. And he said, I'm gonna to go to Washington DC and I'm gonna lecture these politicians just like a bunch of schoolboys. I'm gonna reform them. I'm going to change them. And I'm certainly not gonna compromise with them. If you don't compromise, how much will you get done in politics? Not. Not much. Let me tell you something. Woodrow Wilson, his attitude was this. You know, honest people can disagree. Honest people can disagree on things. So far as abortion is concerned, I tend to be pretty conservative. I think it ought to be limited, maybe restricted. Not quite sure of that, but I tend to lean that way. My brother is pro-choice. He believes that a woman should have a right to, and I believe a woman should have a right to choose too but he's a little more liberal on abortion than I am. We disagree on that. Does that make him a bad person? No. Does that make me a bad person? No. no, one of the greatest things we have. Look, there are people in Russia right now who are disagreeing with this war and they're being taken away along with their whole families and they're never going to be seen again because you don't have the right to disagree. That's why we're so damn disagreeable in this country. We that, That's a right we just love to exercise. And I say power to it. The right to say, I don't think that's right. I disagree. You're wrong. That doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean you're evil. That just means I think you're wrong. And who knows? I may be wrong. Woodrow Wilson believed this. If you disagreed with him, you weren't just wrong. You were evil. You were evil. Okay? He was very controlled. He didn't let his emotions show. He didn't let his emotions show his aides, people who had been around him a long time, knew when it was time to back off because he would be talking and he would be talking just as calmly as I'm talking now to you sitting across the table. Then he'd pick up a pencil, you know, and all of a sudden you'd see a vein come up. He's just, you know, just talking, just as good, but you'll see a vein come up in his forehead. And when he had finally had enough, he'd snap the pencil. Okay, when he snapped the pencil, he better back off. But he never, that's as emotional as he ever got. What killed him? Stress. Huh? Stress. Yeah, a stroke. That's exactly right. You know that there comes a time, let me just give you a little advice. You know that there comes a time when you need to go out to the barn and get the animal and go out in the field where there's nobody even close to you and just spin around and around and around and around and around and just won't let it go and yell, damn it! Just let, let that stress go. Don't have an anvil, use your little brother. But anyway, no, don't do that. I don't want to hear any, any little brother tossing going on. Around. But uh, yeah, Wilson never did that. He just bottled it up inside and it killed him. He's buried in the National Cathedral. When we go to Washington, D.C., and by the way, if you're interested in that tour, it's next is today Tuesday? Yes. A week from? A week from now. Tonight, tonight at 6 o'clock, yeah. Uh, but we go to the National Cathedral, and Woodrow Wilson's buried there. You know, and I often I tell the students, you know, what, what they ought to put on the side of his tomb there is die to the presidency because it literally killed him. He goes charging off to Washington, D.C. He thinks he's pure. He thinks they're dirty. He said, I'm going to change it. I'm going to take on the establishment. And I'm going to change it. Donald Trump said the same thing. Donald Trump said, I'm going to drain the swamp. 
they're a bunch of sleaze balls. I'm gonna he said it's a swamp. I'm gonna drain that. And that appealed to a lot of people. Well, Woodrow Wilson said the same thing. But let me tell you something. Politicians and presidents come and go, and guess what stays? The establishment. Woodrow Wilson beat himself to death. He the presidency literally kills him. And I'm gonna show you that. Okay. Uh, and the establishment still uh, remains. Well, um, in the end, while enjoying some successes, and we're going to talk about those successes, the presidency killed him. Uh, I got this down about Wilson. He's the first president to address the Congress in person since John Adams. You know, the Constitution, the rule book here says that the president has to report to the Congress. It has to report. It doesn't say he has to go over there and talk to them in person. He can just write a report on how the country's doing. It's called the State of the Union. What is the state of the nation? Well, when George Washington, he's the first president, nobody knew how the Constitution worked. And so George Washington read the Constitution. It said the president's support, supposed to report to the Congress. And he just put on his old military uniform and he just walked over to the Senate and stood up and started talking. And he did that seven more times. He said, do it in person. And when he, George Washington retired, he was succeeded as president by his uh, vice president, John Adams. John Adams served four years. John Adams said, Washington went over there personally and talked to them. I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, and so he did. Four times he went over there. Uh, but in 1800, John Adams was defeated by Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson read the Constitution and said this. And by the way, the reason Jefferson read the Constitution this way is that Jefferson stuttered, just like Joe Biden stutters. Jefferson stuttered. And he was a, he was a magnificent writer, but he didn't like making speeches. So he picked up the rule book and read it and said the president will report to the Congress once a year on the State of the Union. And he said it didn't say you have to go over there. So he just wrote a report and sent it over there. And a clerk stood up in the Congress and he read this report on the state of the nation. And Jefferson did that eight times. That was in 1801. You don't have to write this down. That was in 1801. There would not be another president that spoke directly to the Congress, stood in front of them and spoke directly to the Congress for 100 years until Woodrow Wilson in 1913, okay, 1913. So Woodrow Wilson is the first president since John Adams to address the Congress in public, okay, or to, to go over to the Congress and address the con face to face. Have we had any since we? Wilson. Oh, yeah, they've all done it. since. So Wilson starts a tradition, and they all do it. Joe Biden did it a couple of weeks ago. It's called the State of the Union message. You know, he goes, oh, yeah, it's a big deal. They invite foreign ambassadors and have guests up in the gallery. You know, it's a huge thing uh, today. But um, that's all started again by Woodrow Wilson. Okay, well, everybody get up and take a break real quick, and then we'll go on quickly. Okay, well, the very first movie, I'll show you a clip from this. The very first, did I show you those fighting cats? No, I think I showed you, well, you guys not been here, but I showed you the fighting cats. And that lasts about three minutes. When, when people used to say, we're going to the movies, if it wasn't, we're going for two hours, they'd watch something like the fighting cats, then get up and go home. And that was amazing. But the very first feature-length movie was made while Woodrow Wilson was president. Well, it was actually made the year he was elected. Got this down, 1912. And the name of that movie was The Birth of a Nation. The name of that movie was The Birth of a Nation. And it was about the Civil War and Reconstruction. The Birth of a Nation. How long was the movie? Three hours. We've got it down in the library. Does it have sound? No, it's a it's a black and white. I'm going to show you a little clip. But I'm going to show you the most dramatic scene. Out of I'll save you watching all three and a half hours to see the most dramatic scene. 
the birth, it was about the Civil War and Reconstruction. And I want you to know what the movie was about. Here's what it is. You know, the, the movie said, you know, it's the South lost the war. Okay. And when the South lost the war, uh, the freedmen, and you ought to know this because we've done it. So this ought, this ought to ring true to you. The freedmen who were the ex-slaves, right? Yes. yes. And the carpetbaggers, these dishonest northerners, Hello? American senior benefits. Anyway, the um, South lost more than the ex slaves and the carpetbaggers, and the Republicans came down and they punished the white South. You with me so far? Remember talking about that? That was the myth of Reconstruction that they punished. You know, white Southerners could vote, white Southerners could. They really punished all these Southerners who had supported the Confederacy. Especially white Southern women. Get that down. Especially these ex slaves. These ex slaves were always leering around trying to seduce white women. All this is a myth. None of it's true, but that's what the movie said. <laughs> and. Finally, the white race in the South was about to be destroyed, and white Southerners banded together and formed their own army to save the South. And what was that army? What was it? It was the Ku Klux Klan, their own army. And the Ku Klux Klan, these white Southerners, fought back and they chased the Northerners out of the South. They got rid of the carpetbaggers. They got rid of the Republicans. And they put the ex-slaves in their place. Okay? You understand, you understand what I'm saying? So they saved the South. Okay? And the most dramatic scene in the movie, there's a white woman and there's an ex-slave. He's actually a white man in blackface. But there's this... Why, and this black slave, and he's crawling up, he's chasing this white woman through the woods, and she goes out on the ledge of a cliff, and he's crawling up to get her and rape her, and instead of being raped, she jumped to her death. And white audience is watching. I'm going to show you that film clip. White audience is watching that. It made them so angry that they often would just storm out of the movie theater and start going up and down the streets and killing, lynching every black man or woman that they found, okay? Uh, when the producers of the movie asked Wilson to show it in the White House, and he did. Hello? Hello? <clears throat> They um, committed murder. I mean, it so enraged them. Uh, they asked Wilson to show it in the White House. The NAACP, pro, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Persons, the oldest, the oldest civil rights organization in the United States. Mm -hmm. They said they protested in front of. They said, "Don't show that. If you show that in the White House, Mr. President, you will be giving your stamp of approval to this racist garbage." But Wilson showed it, and he came out of that showing. And you've got to remember the movies were brand new. You know, we've all been to movies and it's no big deal. But it, that was huge to, to watch people on the screen. It just, it just was amazing. And Wilson came out and they asked him, what did you think of the movie? And Wilson said, that movie is history written with lightning. In other words, what he was saying, it's true. It's all true. Uh, and again, that kicked off a racial violence all across the country. Um, <clears throat> So let me show you a little piece of this film of the birth of the nation. And you get to see what uh, people used to pay a dime to see, see if you would pay a dime to watch a three hour movie like this.
Okay. Somebody want to turn out the lights? I can do that too. Yeah. All right. Maybe you can see it a little better. Let me get screen here. Want to start? Hmm? Didn't you say like the stuff that happened in the movie didn't really happen? Yeah, this is all just, you know, no. Then why did he say it was true? Huh? Why did he say it was history? Well, that's that's the thing. And you know, Wilson had a doctor's degree. I'm a political science minor. He had a doctor's degree of political science, which is akin to history. He knew it wasn't true. He knew that it wasn't true, but he said that. It's an incredible, you know, why did Teddy Roosevelt say I won't run in 1904? For 1908, you know, I mean, why did they say that? You know, it's just one of those, I guess, unknowns. But I'll, I'll shed some more light on that too about race later on. This is what people used to watch for three hours. This is the birth of the clan. This gives the guy the idea. Thank you. 
to see that. So they saved the white side. KKK members as well. Oh, it is. 